horse and said, you know, we have a bear, you know, do these things. Well, I guess they're worried about people going out and trying to hunt hunting bears now. Well, that or, well, you know, they're protected. So unless your life is threatened, you cannot do anything to a bear. It's always going to be threatened. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's right. Story. Yeah, always. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, the thing is, at least according to the thing, is that uh, it's against the law to even put yourself in a situation where a bear could threaten you. <laughs> That's yeah. all. I don't know, but... Uh, well, if they don't know who did it... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, if they just find him dead somewhere... I don't know. The bear's got a lot of character witnesses out in the woods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. The bear, the whole concept of bears was a thing. Freeze. Yeah, when I first moved here, I lived in Commander Village and kept seeing trash cans out there. I was like, who's a douchebag? He's not going to use trash cans. It was bears, basically. Yeah. I, didn't know that. I didn't think that was a thing either. Mm -hmm. I guess we're right at about 6.30. You want to join? You want to join? We had one. Um, Robert joined us. I think Alberto usually joins. Um, him or Jason. I don't see them. Hello, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Oh. Ralph. Ralphs. Ralphs. Plural. All the Ralphs. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll see if anyone else hops in. I can go ahead and get started then. Um, so to everyone who's new, all one of us, <laughs> um, we meet basically the third Tuesday of every month. Um, I've, I've started to get a little more uh, long term on the calendar, whereas before we've been going kind of month to month. Um, so I finally got three things on the calendar back to back. Mm -hmm. So that's an exciting bit of news. We've got, uh, today we're doing Blazer. Next month, we're going to talk about raspberry pies and then Belena, which used to be resin IO. It was bought out. And that's for managing raspberry pie DevOps pipelines. And then in May, we're looking at um, Kenico 12 and talking not just about Kenico 12, but also about content management in general and what that means for the code side of things, what kind of stuff to keep in mind for content management, dealing with digital marketers, all of the like. And then in June, we've got Sean Wildermuth, um, who you've probably heard his name. He's done a lot of Pluralsight courses, uh, written some books. He's a Microsoft MVP. He's not coming in person, but he's going to be doing a remote presentation. It's not recorded. He's actually going to be presenting just remotely. Um, and he's going to talk about Vuex, which is a branch of Vue.js for state management. And I'll be curious to hear a lot more about that, um, kind of his man state management techniques with Vuex. Um, but today we're looking at Blazor, and if you've heard of it, it's, it's kind of touted as something that would compete with JavaScript or maybe even go so far as to replace JavaScript um, using C Sharp as the one language to rule them all. So you're writing your .NET Core applications, Razor pages, Razor components, and you're going to start using C Sharp now to not only do your back end, but using C Sharp to compile down into WebAssembly on the front end. And WebAssembly isn't a terribly new thing. Blazor is highly new. It's, it's experimental. They don't recommend it in production just yet, but it's something that's kind of an interesting concept Microsoft's put forth. And you'll notice this little graphic here. I've got some different logos going on. The technologies. Yeah. Um, and I can get into that in just a second, but um, that's the chimera of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, WebAssembly and JavaScript. So before I get into Blazor, I'm just going to give you some background on the, the related technologies. Um, one you've heard of for sure, JavaScript. One you, you may have heard of, and especially if you were getting ready for tonight, um, you may have looked into a little bit. And they're, they're highly related. So we've got here, party like it's 1995. <laughs> um, JavaScript came out with Netscape Navigator. And uh, that was one of the first times we had something that could make web pages not just static, HTML and CSS, not just an online book, but actually changing at times. So things that the user could interact with, have a UI that changes, um, things like hover effects, not, not just in CSS, but with JavaScript. 
Then Microsoft released JScript, which was their fun interpretation of JavaScript, which totally contradicted that a different document object model had a different shape and structure to it. And so there, there came this need for standardization. Again, Microsoft with DHTML and Internet Explorer 4. And these were all sort of leading into what we now know as the, the first browser wars. It's kind of like the first, second, and third Game of Thrones or something. <laughs> um, and then finally, not that long after, there was ECMAScript, which is what we now refer to as JavaScript most commonly. And that was what was the 1.0 standardized version of JavaScript. A um, little background, fun facts on these logos. Um, the little red bird character there is Firebird. That was Firefox um, originally. That was their first logo. And then there was a copyright claim, so they decided they would call themselves Mozilla Firebird. And then they switched over to Firefox after they just wouldn't leave them alone with the copyright claims. And their email client was Thunderbird, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they, they wanted that, that to be this kind of big overarching suite of technologies. Um, and then that ended up getting split off. And that's why we now have the open source Mozilla Foundation. And then we have um, Monkey, I think is what they call the, their old Fire, Firefox suite. You have a young audience. Well, thank you. Yeah. Oh. That was a compliment. Xander. Xander. I'm Temporarily, I'm going to meet some people just for fun. Um, and so, but the reason I bring that up is because Netscape Navigator, which was supposed to be here, the logo disappeared for some reason, but that was the first time we introduced JavaScript into the web. And then as it developed, that browser essentially became Firefox. And that's why a lot of times now when you look for JavaScript documentation, you'll see that the Mozilla DevNet or the Mozilla um, developer documentation is actually one of the most thorough. And even the web -wide, World Wide Web Consortium will refer back to them at, at times. Um, and that's why that happens is because they actually initiated a lot of the JavaScript stuff. <coughs> um, then the other side of things, we've got WebAssembly. So <coughs> that is assembly. And this is a very old language. It goes back to analog computers. And assembly has been around basically since computers have been around. Because it's the machine instructions that you use to talk to a computer. It's usually very hardware specific. And it's something that isn't going to work on anything but one platform. You, you may have some similarities in concepts, but the syntax is probably going to be very platform specific. And now we have ASM.js, which actually predates WebAssembly. It comes from 2014. And this was something that Microsoft introduced with Edge. Um, and it's, it's been collaborated in an open source fashion. But essentially, it's, it's low level efficient targets for um, compilers to look at compiling down C code for the web. Um, now, in, in this ASM.js concept, you're, you're still limited by some JavaScript overhead. Um, you have what's called ahead of time compilation, which I'll get into in the next slide. You are limited in that way because you can't do just in time compilation. You can't do, the best way I could describe it is writing code that writes code. Um, having things that either chunk or stream or do things dynamically on the fly. Um, but the reason this, this was needed was for things like um, complex math. Uh, physics engines, video games, uh, things that are going to run native in the browser but act as if they're a native app because there was this push for cross-platform on the web and doing things that you traditionally could only do in a desktop app on the web. And that's what drove a lot of this. And now we've got WebAssembly. It is very fast. Uh, they claim it's about 20 times faster than parsing traditional JS, even ASM.js. And it actually integrates directly with JavaScript via imports. So you could have your JavaScript app application on the client side, and then you could import a WebAssembly module, say, to do some photo manipulation task that, that would be terribly inefficient on a, on a JavaScript framework. And then you can go back and forth, kind of interfacing with it like a black box system. And then we've got here non-determinism. That goes back to this just-in-time, ahead-of-time concept. So you, you don't have to um, 
or sorry, I'm getting a little mixed up here. Basically, the, the, the issue with assembly language was that it was platform specific. So now in the context of WebAssembly, you've got all these different devices, different hardware, and they're all accessing the same application over the web. And so what they've done is they've made what's, they, they kind of refer to it as a JavaScript VM. Um, I still haven't fully wrapped my head around some of that, but basically they have a common set of hardware that they're abstracting out as a virtual layer. And that's what the assembly language is actually targeting. So kind of like you see the V8 engine in Node.js, that's an example of a JavaScript VM. Um, and it's single threaded typically. One thing they do want to get out of WebAssembly in a phase two is multi-threading, things like that, that you definitely can't do in JavaScript. So those are some cool developments as far as what the logic here is, what, what's the target audience. Like I mentioned earlier, streaming, lazy loading, high level abstractions like AI, those are the types of things that they're going to be trying to get out of WebAssembly. So now that we've covered some basic background, this is Blazor. So this is the experimental bleeding edge uh, WebAssembly implementation for ASP.NET Core. And uh, I don't want to come out as negative against it, but at the same time I do. <laughs> um, and I, I've, I've seen a lot of other people talking the same way, that they're kind of comparing this to what we, what we first thought was going to be good about Java applets, Microsoft Silverlight, and Adobe Flash. And basically, you know, those are now deprecated. <laughs> Microsoft doesn't support Silverlight. Um, Flash has been shunned from iOS. <coughs> Applets have several security holes that, that everyone knows about. So the reason they make that comparison is it's the same idea. You want people that are writing, whether it's Java, whether it's some Flash program, or now in this case, C-sharp, that's going to run on the server and client side. And it is a really cool concept, and I, I see a lot of people take it the other way and write JavaScript for the server side and JavaScript for the client side. Um, but some good things about this, and in this case, what we're looking at here is progressive web applications. So you can do this with JavaScript, of course, but you, you want to be able to write code that isn't going to require postbacks. So in traditional C-sharp applications, and this is really targeting web form shops, but really any .NET C-sharp application, you're probably going to be doing some sort of a postback to the server as part of your UI interactions. And if you need something that's running more like a native app, obviously they have to download it at some point. But once it's cached, you can then use something like Blazor to handle logic very similarly to what you used to do. Um, it's not something you're just going to take a, a web forms application and stuff Blazor in. It's, it's a very experimental .NET core type thing. But you're going to have similar syntax that .NET developers are more familiar with, as opposed to trying to get an entire team of .NET developers ramped up on JavaScript. Um, which can be, I'm sure, an interesting educational plan. Uh, and again, you're, you're targeting highly interactive user interface requirements, thinking things like chat notifications, but really more than that, um, we're talking UIs that people are going to do a lot of things with very fast, and they're not going to want to wait for a page refresh. And again, just to reiterate, C sharp is really the reason why people want this. They want to write C sharp in the browser and on the server. <clears throat> so I found this little video. This guy explains a lot of the similar things I just did in about three minutes, but he, he shows some really cool relevant examples that are just explaining why WebAssembly is needed and what, what he thinks is going to happen with it. Like will it replace <laughs> JavaScript, things of that nature. Said and one thing about me quickly, I love Cole Turner. Um, it's an inside joke. I'm here to talk to you today about WebAssembly. You see, the, the, the I need to move quickly, so if I talk too fast, you let me know after. Um, the the reason I'm giving this talk um, came out of a conversation I had with a friend recently, um, and I um, and I said, hey, I'm really excited to implement this thing with JavaScript. It's going to be great. And he says, well, sure, um, if WebAssembly doesn't kill it first. And, and, and I thought, well, hmm. I, and, and then I decided maybe we need to talk about WebAssembly a little bit, because I don't think it's going to kill JavaScript, but a lot of people have been, people have been asking me this and saying this. So let's talk quickly about why WebAssembly, right? Why WebAssembly? Currently, we seem to have this trend of building software for multiple platforms. Um, so it's, it's oftentimes we have an app for the web and an app, in some cases, for native devices. Um, I think 
of Sketch App as a fine example. It, it exists for Mac, <coughs> um, but that's kind of the only place you can use it, last time I checked. And so we have this divide. Um, it's a problem of portability. When the web platform was just beginning, um, the JVM, right, Java applets would have been seen as the way forward. Portability was something we've always wanted. Um, I, WebAssembly brings that to us. We can, we can build applications and kind of run them everywhere in the same execution environment. Just think, how cool would it be to run, like, Photoshop, but everywhere, right? Like 4K video editing software on your phone, uh, in, in, on a, in a browser, um, on Mac, on Windows, kind of everywhere. WebAssembly will help that. Number two, performance. Um, WebAssembly allows us to bypass kind of the high-level optimizations that happen with JavaScript. See, JavaScript is a language with automatic memory management and garbage collection, and it's really high up, but what if we want to run code closer to the metal? What if we want to do like C? but in the browser, right? Get that, get that performance. WebAssembly allows us to do this. Quickly, what is WebAssembly in a sentence? It is this, I, it's a single compile target for the web. What that means is languages that support static typing, things like Rust, um, C++, um, Java even, I, uh, Go, right? These could compile to WebAssembly and be executed in browsers and everywhere. Let's do um, a quick demo of some software that I, I found that really illustrates the power here. All right, so what's happening here is th this is running identical code, <laughs> except the blue is optimized with WebAssembly. And so each player in this game, the blue and the gray, have 200 milliseconds to make a decision for the best possible move. It's identical code, except one has a feature flag for WebAssembly. This is actually running a precursor of WebAssembly called asm.js from Mozilla, but you can see it's able to calculate faster and eventually win. This speed and performance is the appeal that WebAssembly brings to the web. Um, that was a quick demo of the power we can get. Last question, will it kill JS? Um, no, no I, not exactly. See, I think it won't kill JavaScript at all, but I think it might damage the monopoly that JavaScript has on the web platform. I think that's a good thing. Why? Because the web platform is diverse, the web platform is rich that way, and I think we'll add more diversity as more languages compile to WebAssembly. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time. This has been an absolute pleasure. Cool. So, so like I was saying earlier, um, the idea of this is not so much to take over JavaScript or even replace JavaScript, it's to complement it for, for specific cases like he showed where there's a game, maybe there's an AI component going on, something that needs to run really fast and that JavaScript is just gonna be a bottleneck for it. I would argue most applications aren't gonna need Blazor, they're not gonna need WebAssembly. It's more something you can do to either enhance them or in the case of gaming, it may actually be a core requirement that you can't get anywhere near the type of frame rate you want or the type of uh, compatibility you're wanting without WebAssembly. So it's, it's just like you would say something you could develop in C-sharp, but you could also develop in C++. And it's, it's a very similar distinction. You can use JavaScript or you could use WebAssembly. One's more low level, one's more high level. So let's go through. I've got a little technical demo here, very basic very low level, no pun intended. And I'll just start fresh. I've got this little script run that, oh, that's unfortunate. Well, I've still got most of my stuff right here. So um, you'll see here, um, I'm running in VS Code. I'm not running in Visual Studio. You can run this in Visual Studio, but for me, the startup was a little simpler in VS Code. Um, just like with all .NET Core lately, you can do things on a Mac, on Linux, on Windows. So they try to take Visual Studio out of the equation wherever possible. And they offer things like the .NET CLI. Um, so this will look very familiar <laughs> with anything with a .NET Core, really even .NET application. You've got a web root, and I think I can make this a little bigger. There we go. Um, You've got this new imports file, which is just bringing in all the basic things, the project name. You've got some stuff for web APIs. You've got an app file. All the things you're used to seeing in .NET Core. Now here, there's some dependency injection going on. You've got this web host that is actually specifically optimized for Blazor. 
And then in the startup, you're just adding in your app components. So there's not much going on, but you could add other middleware like you would in an MVC app. So here we've got some CSS. This is just stuff that's going to get referenced by the application. So let me just boot this up so you can see what it looks like on the front end. I think that'll help illustrate some of what it's trying to accomplish here. So I've got it running. I'm going to refresh this page. Okay, so they have two examples here. These are just the basic examples that come from Microsoft. The first one is as about as basic as it can get. You've got a counter. And let me actually undo something really quick and then I'll show you what, what it was in another moment. Okay, and I'll run that again. And I'll go back here and refresh the page. Still thinking about it. There we go. So this is just as fast as JavaScript. It's not really slowing down at all. Just keep clicking. Um, <clears throat> behind the scenes, if I were to inspect this or look at the source, you've got these two files here, mono.js, which mono.js, um, I think I can make this bigger as well. That's essentially their .NET uh, runtime that they're using for WebAssembly. And then WebAssembly, just pulling in a component here. If I open that up, it's just a minimized JavaScript file. That's not actually the, the logic of the application. The logic is in WebAssembly itself. So if I go under this, this WASM folder, you've got mono and then mono.wasm. You'll see here, refresh the page so it loads. Um, if you've done anything with assembly in school, like the Mars application or other stuff like that, this should look fairly familiar. These are all hex values. And these are basically points in memory. Um, it's telling you exactly what's happening. This stuff's all stored in memory and ready to execute. And this is all super low level. Um, they're not telling you what these params are. These are all just pointers to other things. So. We're not going to reverse engineer most of it, this, but the idea is that it is there. <laughs> the other thing they want to add is being able to do, kind of like you see with source maps a lot of times with JavaScript, you've got minified stuff and then unminified stuff. They want to be able to take things like this and then debug, step through it. Um, it's a little trickier with assembly because there may be some more optimiz optimizations going on than you're probably used to, but that's going to be one of those really cool features to have in there. So going back to the application here, we've got two main examples. Um, there was that counter I just showed you. And then this one is a little less trivial. It's a web API, so it's getting something. And the idea is that this data could be dynamic. Right now it's not. It's just getting the data and doing some lazy loading. So you'll see it says loading for a second there. So I'll go in here. I'll start with a simple one first, the counter. And very basic, it's just pulling in this variable like you would in a normal razor component. And then it's incrementing it whenever that method gets called and that method gets called on click. And this is kind of similar to JavaScript, how you're passing the function as a variable in, in essence, they call that first order functions. Um, you're passing it in as a callback that then is gonna get called on click. Now, if I were to go in here and say I, for some reason, needed it to wait and do something. The simple way for me to simulate that is to do a sleep. So as opposed to doing set timeout in JavaScript, if you're used to C Sharp and you're more familiar with that, you could do system.threading.thread.sleep and tell it, okay, I want you to sleep for 500 milliseconds. Now really, you'd probably be doing something. <coughs> this is just an example of, of something you can add in from the server side that ends up running on the client side. So I will rerun this just to make sure it's all fresh. Oh, it didn't put a semicolon. OK. 
Okay. So now I'll refresh this, and you'll see that um, it's really doing the same thing, but it's going to be a little bit slower. So just as a basic example that it's affecting the client side without having to do a post back. That's kind of the concept there. So it's waiting a half a second before it continues. And you could do other things, like you could do calculations every time that it's hitting a number saying, okay, is this greater than something? Um, obviously your business logic's gonna determine that. But that was the first example. And then here, this one, fetch data is a little more interesting. So traditionally with JavaScript, it can get kind of messy to do web API calls. In C Sharp, it's a little simpler. You, you have all these asynchronous methods that are available to you from the HTTP class. So I'm injecting kind of like dependency injection, um, an HTTP client as HTTP. And then down here, I'm calling get JSON async, which again, I'm gonna undo something. I was experimenting with this a little bit. Get JSON async. And then this is an async method and I'm awaiting <coughs> the async return value. And then there's just a little POCO class um, here. It's got some properties on it. And these are gonna be found inside of a JSON file. And so those get put into this, but it's not synchronous. You don't know what point that's gonna get loaded. So you need some sort of a lazy loading component or just awkward silence. <laughs> um, and so here, interestingly enough, it's, it knows behind the scenes that that's asynchronous. So you're, you're setting it to null at first, or no, sorry, you're checking if it's null. And if it's null, you're gonna display this laser loading message, simple as that. And then if it's not null, you're gonna do this. Now traditionally, you would see something like this and it would, it would say loading, and then you'd have to refresh the page or do something different, something from the client side. But this is all getting implied on the client side. And down here, you're getting in the properties and they're not gonna get no reference exceptions because this here, obviously you have to know those properties are there, but um, so that's pretty straightforward on that one. I go in here and I look at the, the data in the browser. It's gonna be very similar to the counter. You've got a little more HTML here, some nested components like a table, but um, if I go to the debugger, I think that's where, storage. What's I hear? I had somewhere here, we'll just pull it up in, um, in VS Code to see the actual body of that JSON mm -hmm. file. So this here is what it looks like. Um, basically a very standard JSON, it's getting that via web API. Now you could do other things with this, so you could tell it, you know, convert these to some other unit at runtime. You could have the user interact with it and toggle things, and that would all be done through this Razor syntax. So things like other UI components, buttons, tables, you can manipulate all of that from the back end without having to do postbacks anymore. Um, anything else of interest in this one? Let's see. Let me pull up on the left here just to show you a little background on what kind of stuff I had to do to get this running in here. So it's, it's based on ASP.NET Core 3 Preview 3. So it's not something that, again, is recommended for production. It's in a preview right now. And also that it's requiring, if you're doing it in Visual Studio, you have to have Visual Studio 2019. So they say here, the two ways you can do it is with the Visual Studio 2019 preview or the dot, and the .NET Core SDK preview. And you also have to run a command line tool just to get it enabled, to even have that template open to you. So this here is gonna do interactive, making the template available. And the way I ran it was actually here saying .NET new, which creates a project without a solution file, but then you can run it from the command line. 
and then it always has that that port number. So I think that I, I wanted to go a bit deeper on it, but basically ran out of time. <laughs> so um, any specific questions or something you'd be curious about with Blazor? Is it going to ever not be experimental? That's what I hope. It's been experimental for the last year or so. You know, the weird thing is, um, if you look at the working draft of the spec for it, it says it's already in 1.0. Or no, that's WebAssembly. Sorry, so WebAssembly certainly is not experimental, but Blazor is. Um, I don't know that they have a specific date on when it's going to not be experimental, but I would guess it's probably going to be around the time Visual Studio 2019 is not experimental because they probably want to ship those together as, as a package deal, basically. This is 2019 here, what you're using? This is actually VS Code. I do have 2019. Okay. Um, you'll see it's, it's very, very much like a Mac. That's the best way I could explain it. They've taken a lot of the minimalist Apple type look. Mm -hmm. um, open a project. So I got in here. This is the one we were working with. And the first thing you'll notice if you boot up something like that from the command line is it doesn't have an SLN file. So as soon as you open it in Visual Studio, it's going to generate an SLN file. Sure. And then no matter what you've done, if you hit save, it's going to ask you to save that SLN file. And if you already have an SLN, and it just open that. Like, yeah, exactly. So the SLN file isn't actually required to run .NET Core applications, and that's part of the cross-platform concept. You don't have to open it in Visual Studio. They have stuff like Visual Studio for Mac, but really they're targeting stuff like Visual Studio Code or any editor you'd want to use, whether it even be Vim or something on the command line. And then in here, everything should look fairly similar as well. It's just... You know, you've got your folders with your files in them. You've got a web root that is dynamically picking up what's in that folder. <clears throat> you've got your debugging and all that. Well, that solution file is mainly just for Visual Studio. Anyways. Yeah. And you could have and even NuGet packages and stuff like that. It's all on the project level. Um, you're having to pick which projects those are in. It's just got some stuff like your Visual Studio preferences. Um, overall, though, I'm not noticing a ton of differences between 2019 and 2017. I think most of it's going to be in what types of APIs it supports, um, sort of core functionality like that, not so much moving UI around. Yeah, you know, we're, uh, we're starting to use like a lot of .NET standard, .NET Core. Yeah. The biggest difference is like out of the box, like how the projects are configured versus regular .NET framework. And we're mixing them with .NET Framework, so it was kind of annoying. <laughs> but you can change it. You know, you, you can go in there and make it act like a regular project file. You just have to turn certain things on. Or whatever. Yeah. And uh, but now, of course, we're running into the walls because we're new to it. So, like, mm -hmm. so things like uh, the package config versus package references, and yeah, you, know, like, uh, you can't mix them apparently, and like <laughs> stuff like that, just running into problems. <laughs> Another fun one, if you have spaces in your uh, folder or project names, yeah, or a percent twenty, which it interprets as a space, mm -hmm. it will fail to build. It will fail to pick up that the references exist. Oh uh, yeah, in core. Yeah, and the weird thing was it'll it'll get you halfway there, but then it'll say you need to restore the packages. Oh, but there's no packages, and you look in the file system, there are packages. There is packages config. <laughs> yeah, spaces are bad. I try yeah. to avoid them. So you just remove the space and it fixes itself. Yeah, the guy, he kept putting spaces in his branches and he couldn't figure out why stuff wasn't working or whatever. Yeah. Like, well, I didn't think it would let you put spaces in them. Yeah, well, it won't act very well if you do it. But <laughs> <laughs> I know if you use uh, Visual Studio, it won't let you do it. Yeah, I don't know how you're doing it. Yeah, so you got to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Likely to just taken off, do you think? I mean, you kind of addressed it earlier. But. Well, WebAssembly originally was written for C, and, uh, specifically C, not even C++, really. Um, and so they've, they've seen a lot of movement like Blazor, um, things that are getting those languages into WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is what's driving it. Um, I think that's going to grow a lot. But the types of people who are using WebAssembly in general are going to be more like C or C++ developers probably, at least for the short term. Um, I think the appeal of it from a C-sharp standpoint, things like Blazor, is not having to retrain .NET people to do JavaScript. 
And I think that's, it does have its value, but from a technical standpoint, there's not really a big advantage um, over just doing something like JavaScript or ASMJS or writing it in C to, you know, there's not really a specific advantage for C Sharp. So I'm not sure how it's going to turn out, but it's definitely something that's, that's competing. Um, we'll see which one wins out. So if you're not in a Microsoft shop, then you're not going to pick up on Blazor and say, oh, this is for us. Yeah, because they, they might as well just be using the, their other language of choice. Um, and I don't know for sure whether there's actually been any work on the Java front, but I know C was the big push initially. So we'll see. Obviously, it's not even release yet, so it's that tells you they're they're still working on it. I forget what team they said was that was doing most of the development. Is can't remember now. <laughs> Just Gary, I'm imagining like somebody where we're taking our C code written in the '90s and running it. <laughs> the problem is JavaScript's already got way too strong of a foothold and you're not going to disrupt it. <laughs> Most of your, your developers that are strong in JavaScript are not going to move to this. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. This is like something to cater to the developers that are scared to learn JavaScript for some reason. <laughs> Seems like Microsoft's kind of going back to their old ways with it to me. I mean, yeah, you look at things like Silverlight, it's very similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the, the web assembly is more standardized across everything. So I mean, it's not really like going to Silverlight. No, because Silverlight was a Microsoft specific technology. Right. Whereas this web assembly has been uh, vetted by all the major browsers mm -hmm. and, you know, all those members on a working group and the like. All they're doing is taking C sharp and make it fit into the web assembly, basically. Yeah. Not net in the web assembly. Yeah. So I would say of your JavaScript developer community, about 0.01% of them are C Sharp developers. So you're really not going to change a whole lot. If anything, you're just going to make the JavaScript hold stronger because you're now bringing in people that are, you know, into the, you're bringing in C Sharp developers into the, that type of world. Well, that's just like everything else. Though. Eventually, those, all those JavaScript developers will turn to something else 10 years from now or whatever, and they'll be doing something different. It don't last. None of that stuff lasts. I think we started with JavaScript being begun in what? 1995. Uh, uh, it's still it's here, still but so is a lot of other things. But I'm just saying all of the, you know, they just, even, even in JavaScript, they move from framework to framework. You know, it, this is hot. And then it fades out. And then now this is hot, you know, and it'll just be the same way. 